Greetings, friends of astrobiology. Welcome back to Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists. My name is Sanjay Som, and this program is made possible by contributions from the NASA Astrobiology Program and the non-profit Blue Marble Space. Last month, my fiercely, soon-to-be ferociously bearded co-host, the cosmobiologist, Dr. Graham Lau, had a wonderful conversation with our guest, Dr. Bruce Damer, and we talked about origin of life research, we talked about asteroid capture, and so this month, to give it another shot at the origin of life thought and on the latest science behind it, no, we have none other than astrobiologist extraordinaire Dr. Lori Barge from NASA JPL, which is located just outside of Los Angeles in California. We'll be talking about galaxies, we'll be talking about Mars, we'll be talking about ocean exploration, hydrothermal vents, origin of life, and a whole lot more. So I hope you're all excited as I am for this wonderful conversation. But first, it's time for your monthly background quiz. Mike, if you could put up the background that Graham had last month. A few of you got it right. As you can recognize, it was the Aeolian Islands in the Mediterranean, home of the majestic volcano Stromboli, which has been continuously erupting roughly for the past 2,000 years. The Romans know about it, and we know about it today because the last explosive eruption was actually just this past August. It rises about almost at 1,000 meters above sea level, and it's a lovely ride from Sicily on a beautiful ferry to, to get to the Aeolian Islands. Sicily, of course, is home to the, uh, the Etna massive uh, volcano. And so uh, a few of you got it right, but our winner, who's going to win the uh, NASA stickers as well as the Astrobiology Graphics novel, is Jaime Cordova, who is tweeting at JaimeCord underscore 94. Congratulations, and thank you very much for playing. And we also want to recognize our ambassador of the month. To, all, to make this show successful, we need all of your help in tweeting, in retweeting, in telling your friends, and telling your teachers about our program. And the person who does it the, the most during the, the pre previous, previous to this episode uh, gets the award. And uh, this month, uh, again, for the second time, is Marianne Denton. Thank you so much, Marianne. And uh, really grateful for all your support and for your, uh, for your love of the show. Uh, we love to have uh, fans like you and fans for all of you, from all of you, from all over the world. And uh, thank you again for all you're doing for the program. Um, okay, so to get things started, uh, Laurie Barge is an incredible astrobiologist. It's been really hard to decide where to start. So, but like we like to do in, the, uh, in, this, in this series, is turn back the wheels of time a little bit and, uh, and, and welcome Laurie. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit how or what events got you started thinking about science when you were perhaps a kid? Well, I've always actually been really interested in space. I don't even really know why this began, but I was kind of like a nerdy kid who liked space, but not exclusively. I liked a lot of stuff. And I was reading like the little kid books about stars and planets and things like that. And, and I remember one big thing, though, was when uh, the Voyager flyby of Neptune happened in 1989. And that was, that was a big deal because I had just never, never seen Neptune before, really up close, like none of us had. And so it was really, it was on the news and I got to stay up late and look at it and it was really cool. And so I think that was one of the things that made me think, you know, maybe I'll actually go work for NASA. And I didn't know what that meant. I was young, but yeah, that was one thing. And then I just kind of throughout, I guess, my elementary school and high school, I was always kind of interested in this stuff in the background among other other types of interests and it wasn't really until college that I decided that I was going to do, do this as a career. Wonderful yeah I remember the Voyager 2 flyby as well uh, of Neptune in 1989. I was eight years old and it's still very much ingrained in my memory and a big part of why I became a scientist as well. But even in, in college, from what I understand, you're not entirely sure whether to follow a career in science. You have a very strong interest in theater as well, right? That's right. And actually, in high school, theater was my huge thing. Like, I was really into it. It's what I spent all my time on. And so I thought, well, I don't know what I want to major in. Maybe theater, maybe astronomy, because I like the stars. And I just didn't know. And I actually, I applied for college in, in theater. Like, I, I sent in applications for theater schools, and I made a portfolio and everything. But I also applied for being a physics and astronomy major. And in the end, I got into a school that had no theater degree for undergrad. And so I got the minor instead, and I was just doing student theater. But again, in college, I was super into it. And I spent, I'd say, way more time doing that than I was doing, maybe equal, I'd say, to what I was doing with my astronomy. And so it was, it was a real tough thing. And I'd say it wasn't until maybe like junior year, senior year of college when I really decided I'm going to get a PhD in science and this is going to be the career. 
Very cool, very cool. For those of you who are watching, uh, don't forget you can ask questions uh, in the in the chat boxes on Saganet or on Twitter. Please use hashtag Ask Astrobio. If you're watching on Facebook, ask the questions too, and we'll uh, we'll queue them up for Dr. Barge later on in the show. So you ended up getting a bachelor's degree in astronomy, Laurie. Is that right? And then you're you're studying yeah. then the the, the Magellan, Magellanic clouds. Uh, tell us more yeah. about the research. <laughs> So I, as an undergrad, I think I started this sophomore year, I was doing research on binary stars, which is where you have two stars that orbit each other. And that, that was pretty interesting because you can measure their mass and their brightness, and then you can get the periodicity of the orbit. And from that, you can try to get at their distance. And so I was trying to understand, you know, from these spectral observations where you see the, the spectral lines kind of shift with redshift and blue shift, can you tell, you know, how these are orbiting and what, what their properties might be? So that was my research as an undergraduate, and the binary systems I studied were in the small Magellanic Cloud, which is a small galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. And it was funny because those you can only see from the southern hemisphere of Earth, and so I'd never actually seen them before, so I was studying stuff that I'd never seen. So later, much later, I was able to see them in the sky, and that was really awesome. I think the sky in the southern hemisphere is a lot more beautiful than it is in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, the, the, the Milky Way is gorgeous. You can see the two Magellanic clouds, which are, of course, not clouds, but galaxies, uh, just there in the distance. And for scale, you know, they are, of course, at different distances, and they are about 10, or, uh, 10 times smaller than our own galaxy, but nonetheless extremely impressive. So, and, and so what happened after you, just, you got your bachelor's in astronomy? Because you ended up working in, in, on, on Mars geology for, in, in graduate school to start with, no? Yeah, it was it was interesting. I was I was basically all this time just following what I like doing and I would always have, you know, a few things that I really enjoyed and I would do them more and then I would discover something new that I enjoyed and I would do that and then that's kind of still what I'm doing. And so in um when I was a, a college student, I was doing this research and I liked that, taking classes and I enjoyed astronomy. We took a class called I can't even remember, I think it was meteorology of the planets and we each had to do a report on a planet. So I got the planet Venus and I did this report and I got so into it and it was super exciting. And I thought, wow, planets are awesome. Like, I wish I could study the planets. But when I was reading the books about Venus, I didn't know what these names meant, like basalt or granite, you know. And so I thought I better get I better learn geology. But I'm also afraid to change my field because you, you can't just go to grad school in a whole different major than what your undergrad major was. Right. And so that's what I thought at the time. So I applied to grad school in, in astronomy, but also in geology, like a, just a few applications for geology. And I actually got into one school for geology and I was really scared to accept actually, because I thought I can't, you can't go get a PhD in something I did not major in. So I'm really glad that I you know, took that leap and did that. And then actually also the summer after my undergraduate degree, I did an internship at NASA Goddard where I was working on uh, Mars chemical analysis type stuff like biosignatures. But again, I was not a chemistry major. So this is all very new to me. And I just kept doing stuff that was very new, but really exciting. I think that's the hallmark of being an astrobiologist, to be able to take a bunch of different disciplines and tie them all together to focus on a science question. And, uh, you know, I did the same thing. You know, I changed uh, my majors after my master's degree in engineering towards the earth sciences. So it's, it's very possible. And those of you who are, who are watching on our students, you know, wondering what to major in to do astrobiology, actually you can major in really whatever you want. It is a scientific question there after that makes you an astrobiologist. But uh, Laurie, after getting, uh, I think your master's in geology and looking at the blueberries on Mars, right? Perhaps we can talk about the, the significance of those blueberries, those tiny spherules of, of hematite and iron oxide that, that contain um, uh, sand grains. They tell us something about the early environment of Mars, no? Yeah, and actually I started grad school in 2004. So that was when the Mars Exploration Rovers had landed and they had, Opportunity Rover had discovered these blueberries, which are little little tiny spherules of iron oxide. And at the time people didn't know how they formed and maybe it had to do with water or maybe not. And it was this big, you know, interesting mystery. And so I was meanwhile learning geology for the first time and also kind of learning chemistry. And so I got really interested in this and I thought, well, maybe I can try to make these in the lab or maybe understand, could they have been related to organics or something like that? And so I did my thesis work on looking at how patterns form in geological systems without life, but can organics affect the pattern? And what does that all mean for looking for life elsewhere? 
So I think that that seeded your brain in the possibilities of laboratory synthesis, right? Of creating stuff you see in real world in the lab to really focus scientific questions and answering processes or how life affects them or not, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, lab work was, it was a challenge then because I, you don't really do a lot of lab work as an astronomy major. <laughs> and so when I, when I got to grad school, I was learning for the first time just simple techniques and like, you know, how to do chemicals and, and all that. And so that was, that was challenging, but learning to do that, it was, it was more than just focusing on this project. It was a whole new technique and field of science that I, once I got into it, I realized I could apply it to all kinds of stuff. And so that kind of grew, I guess, over the years in grad school. And then by the end, I thought, well, there's so many things I could do now with, with all these different types of science skills. So how did your interests change from looking at the Martian surface geology and interpretation of the rocks to say something about the environment to what you're doing now, which is trying to simulate hydrothermal uh, hot springs or hydrothermal chimneys in the lab? Well, it's, it's funny, it's kind of, it was a planned transition and it kind of was stuff that just happened. Like I was really interested in biosignatures and also in grad school, I started getting a lot more involved with astrobiology as a field, even though technically my, my degree was not astrobiology. So this was all outside activities that I was doing to try to see if this is a field I wanted to be in. So I did all these astrobiology things. And then when thinking about biosignatures, it's interesting because my research found that when we added organics to these systems of minerals, the patterns that were formed would change. And so you could sort of use those patterns as a diagnostic trace of whether there were organics there in the first place. And then I thought, well, you know, it's, it's only a small leap from saying organics affect minerals and you can use that as a diagnostic tool to saying, well, if organics and minerals are so intertwined, then is that a, you know, can you actually go toward biology that way? I mean, maybe part of the reason it looks so much like life is because it's related to how life began. And so I had an interest in origin of life and I hadn't really planned to start working on ocean related stuff. But through the people I met at conferences, I ended up getting a postdoc at JPL that was focused on Europa, focused on icy worlds in particular. And so I kind of threw myself into that and I learned that the ocean is really awesome. And there's a whole bunch of research there, too. And so now I'd say about half of my work is kind of soil science, mineralogy, organic related. It is a little bit in some ways related to what I did as a PhD student, but then the other half is oceanography and, you know, missions to the deep sea and how you can explore vents and what that might mean for life on other worlds. And so by patterns of, of minerals, are you saying that the, the, the shape that some minerals inside rocks can take is a signature of whether they've been affected by biological processes? Well, it's, it might be a signature of that, or it could be a signature of whether organics have been there. And organics don't have to be biological. So that was that was one of the main things that that I found is that you can you can tweak systems a lot in the lab by adding organics, and organics will change the minerals, and the minerals can affect the organics. But it doesn't have to be biological. Although biology can also do this sometimes, and so when you're trying to understand, you know, whether or not life caused a certain effect, you have to think about why exactly would life cause that? And is it just because organics can cause it? And how do you tell the difference? It's a really complicated problem. That sounds like it. So, so geological or geochemical processes, essentially water and rocks interacting in, with certain, in a certain way, can create the components that life can take advantage of to then evolve from? I mean, I think so. And that's, you know, a lot of research in this field has been showing now how there's a lot of energy sources and geological settings, very interesting organic chemistry can emerge, a non-biological system. And the complexity that you can get in organic chemical systems is really huge. And you can see this from all the, all the work in the origin of life field. You know, there's not microbes doing these things. It's abiotic lab chemistry, and yet it's so complex. And so how much of that happened on other planets? We know at least it happened on Earth to make life, but how far did it go on Mars, if at all? Or what about places like Ceres or Enceladus? So it's really interesting to tweak the geological condition and see what other effects you can get. Yeah, so you can create really complex molecules from really simple building blocks using kind of the, 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 ther the thermal rock water system as the engine, right? Yeah, and I mean, some of this, some chemistry can emerge in a hydrothermal vent, so a deep sea system where you have these gradients of temperature and pH and redox potential and chemistry. 
and you can get a lot of interesting chemistry there. And vent systems are so diverse. You have all types of gradients, you have different depths and, you know, different types of cycling and whatnot. And so it's, it's just a whole, this, this whole interesting world to explore of what organic chemistry can do, but there's other environments too that can do things. And so it's not so much about exactly what environment it is. It's more about what conditions can lead to what types of products and what types of systems. And then it's possible you might have a condition that could be found in multiple environments, right? And so maybe the origin of life has multiple possibilities or multiple possible outcomes. And, and it starts to get very philosophical. <laughs> you think there was a unique setting for the origin of life or different planetary environments created different things that then came together to promote the chemistry that led to life? You know, I don't, I don't actually know. I mean, nobody knows really. And I don't know if that's even really the right question to be asking because it's, it's not, I don't think, about what exact environment caused the origin of life. Because I think that's misdirecting because you don't know what conditions different environments can have. And the important thing is that conditions that are needed for the chemistry to occur are present. And as long as those conditions are present, any environment that provides them should be fine. And that also kind of opens up more stuff for planetary exploration because if we talk about what conditions do you need, then you can say, you know, do let's say a vent on Enceladus or in Europa have that condition, or did you have it on like a, a pool on Mars in the ancient past or something in Mars subsurface today? And so I, I don't really think about it as it has to be this environment or that environment or something. But yet you study hydrothermal systems in the labs. I'm very curious, first of all, how does one create such hydrothermal systems in the lab? And, and then once you have created them, how do you measure interesting chemistry in them? Yeah, so I think it's really fun to study what happens at the seafloor because that's the majority of the surface of the earth is an ocean. And also on other worlds like Europa and Enceladus where you don't have any land, what, what is possible even in these systems? And so when we look at vents, we see that there's, there's all these sub seafloor kind of fluid alteration processes, and then the fluids come up and they, inter and they interface with the ocean. And you can grow these sediments and chimneys, and there's a lot of huge types of chimneys that can form on earth. They form, they can be very quick forming, they can be very slow forming. And so in the lab, we actually will simulate some of this by having a, a little vessel that is full of ocean water. And so this could be early earth, modern earth, you know, whatever ocean you want. And then we slowly inject a hydrothermal solution, which mimics how the solutions come up from the sea floor. So if you inject that slowly from the bottom, you can grow chimneys in the lab and you can see how that chemistry might be similar to stuff that you see in nature. Wow. So how big are, you, are, are your chimneys? <laughs> Not that big. <laughs> it <is> big. <laughs> yeah, it's more about the chemistry. Little chimneys, like great bottles this big, chimneys this big. And it's more about the gradients. You can, you can have chemistry occurring in a small system or a big system. It, it just depends on what minerals and materials are present and what gradients are there. And we can simulate a lot of the important properties of vents in the lab with small chimneys. But for some cases, you do need to go to the field and look at the much bigger ones. And then we're going to talk about field work in a second, but I'm <laughs> curious because the, the gradients are, are at, the, at, the, at the boundary between the chimney and the ocean water, right? So how do you measure in the lab what's going on there? Do you have special equipment? Is it something you have to touch or you shine a laser through or like what are your yeah. lab techniques? Well, so one of the techniques we use is uh, using electrodes. And so kind of like a battery, if you have a two electrodes and you put them where you're gonna have one kind of end of your redox potential and one where you have the other end, you can measure the potential and the current that's generated. And so we, if we grow a chimney and you put an electrode inside the chimney and you have another one that's outside in the ocean water, then you can measure the potential that that chimney is generating. And you can also measure say electrical current and so on. So it's a little bit similar to how if you have a battery and you put, you know, your two ends of the multimeter on it, you can measure the battery. And so the chimney is like a battery, too. And so we did some research where we, we generated energy, electrical energy from a chimney in the lab. And we linked several of those chimneys together in order to light a little LED light bulb just to show that, you know, these do generate energy and the chimneys are like little batteries. And so instead, you could imagine that instead of light bulbs, it's, it's energy for chemical reactions. And you might be able to do things like, say, provide organic compounds that might not exist before. So cool. So it makes sense that life requires energy. And so you're able to measure the voltage inside the chimney in the ocean, which is an expression of energy. And, and so such settings could trigger 
um, situations where life can take advantage of that. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, life, the origin of life needs energy, but life also, extant life needs energy too. And so kind of understanding what level of redox potentials you have in vents and what different energy sources and energy sinks are there can help you understand what types of life could be there. Because life can use, it can use things that are coming out of the vent and not fluid. It can use things from the seawater. It can use the actual minerals of the chimney itself. Just so it depends. And understanding what life can live in what type of system can maybe help us predict how we would look for life on other planets. Very cool. So all the life we see around us today ultimately de depends on sunlight. But of course, life at the seafloor, there is no sunlight. And we think about life on those uh, icy worlds around, you, around Saturn or around Jupiter. There's also no sunlight at the seafloor. And so the chemistry you're exploring is a source of energy for potential biology that's down there. That's absolutely fascinating. Now, how do you measure that in real life? Suppose we had a mission to go to these uh, extraterrestrial oceans and we could go to the seafloor, how would one understand them? And from what I understand, you've been recently funded by NASA to develop such <laughs> technologies. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so this is a project called Invader, which is the in-situ vent analysis dive bot for exobiology research. And it's led by Pablo Sobran at SETI, and I'm the science PI. And so this is, this is a, a project where we're going to send an underwater laser to a vent in the Pacific Ocean. And if you if you were on another planet and you had a vent that you wanted to look at, I mean, even finding the vent would be a real challenge, right? Because you don't know exactly where they are. And also, there's not going to be technology to have immediate decision making when you're in that situation. So the mission would have to be able to say, is this a good vent to study? How long should I study it? Which types of data should I take for how long, et cetera? And so also, you wouldn't really necessarily be able to take samples from the chimney a lot of uh, work that's being done in oceanography, you can actually take samples and analyze fluids. But if you couldn't do that, how much information could you get if you were just looking at the chimney from, say, a few meters away? And so the Invader project is going to use a laser, a Raman laser and a LIBS to look at these chimneys and see, can we detect life in this chimney? Of course, we know that there's already life here, but can we detect it with this payload? And what information can you get about the astrobiology and the habitability of this environment from a standoff payload. And then what, how does that compare to what we already know from things like sampling? Cool. Tell us a bit more about how a LIBS work. Uh, so these, these lasers, uh, they function in different ways. So a LIBS tells you what elements are in the sample. And then a Raman will tell you uh, elements and minerals and molecules. And these can both do for solid and for liquid. So we're going to be testing not just in the deployment where we, where we put the laser in the ocean, but also in the lab, we'll be testing with lasers using actual vent samples. What, does, what do these look like? And can you find life? And how, what other types of habitability can you see in these samples? So things like what are the elements present, like carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, and what minerals are there? And are these minerals that can provide energy? And so it's going to be pretty exciting. So the point of going to an actual vent in the Pacific Ocean with the instrument is to look at the vent using those lasers and using uh, the technologies you've been describing, and then, but also sampling and then comparing if you could, if, what information you can gather just from the laser compared to what's actually there. Is that right? Yeah, and you know this is why for these for some of these types of programs, it's not just science where you're learning new information about a site. It's also science operations where you know it's it's the techniques of how do you get science in the first place and how does this work? Because there's a lot of decision making and you know kind of if then if then type of stuff that goes into how you approach getting information from a site, especially when you're limited on things like power or data or a number of spectra or you know resolution and things like that. And so just understanding questions like if even if you have a perfect map of the chimney, you know, how often do you need that map in order to tell how it's changing? Or if you have, let's say, seven points that you can take spectra from, where would you place those in order to understand if there's a mineral present or not? And things like that, you can kind of make predictions and test this in the lab and then try to prepare for what this might be like on a mission. That's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> Um, so I'm mean, just curious about whether your uh, your training in theater, you know, way back when in undergrad, is coming back to you now. Does it help you in in your in your in your science? You know, it's funny because it actually does. I never thought it would, <laughs> but I mean, first of all, I had no idea when I was majoring in astronomy that having a, being a scientist as a career was so dependent on public speaking and also on 
kind of the arts, you know, like graphic design and giving good presentations and all of that stuff is so important. And I had no idea. And so when I was in, a, I think in high school, I actually took acting class a couple of times. And then in college, I took some more acting class. And I was never, I was not an actor in theater. I was mostly doing the set design and costumes. So I was really into all that, but it's about creating a world and, you know, painting and sewing and stuff like that. But also when you're doing theater for set design, for example, it's a lot of project management. So you have a budget and you have materials and you have, you know, you have assets, things like power tools and like your stock of paints and woods and whatnot. And you have to manage your supplies and your budget and your personnel and your schedule. And it turns out that science is a lot like that, especially in chemistry, because when you run a lab group, you have a budget and you have supplies and you have people and you have deadlines and you have to enact these big projects where you don't know what the outcome is going to quite be. And so it turned out project management was an excellent skill to learn for this career. Yeah, um, I wonder sometimes why the fundamentals of, of business is, is not taught as part of graduate school to become a, a PI. You know, it seems like it's really useful skills to know how to create a Gantt chart and and find out where your uh, where your key your key milestones are. That's important uh, skills to be able to put together. Um, so, anyways, if those of you who are watching, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Bard, we're going to open up for questions very soon. Don't forget to ask your questions right on the on the Seginet.org chat. If you're watching on Seginet.org on Seginet, um, if you're on Twitter, please use hashtag Ask Astrobio or on Facebook right there in the in the comments down below. Um, you have a slew of hobbies, and uh, uh, w one of them that I find particularly fascinating is that you are you are an eclipse chaser. Tell us more about that. <laughs> well, I've only just started this because the first eclipse, the first total eclipse in my lifetime in the U.S. was the one in 2017. So this started in Oregon and it went all the way across the U.S. And so I had never seen a total eclipse, and I really wanted to. So I went to Oregon with my husband, and we went to Madras, Oregon where there was this big kind of camping event in a, in a field. And so we camped for a couple days and then the eclipse was around noon. And so it was right overhead in the sky and it was really amazing. And so I thought, wow, I'm really glad I you know, took the effort to go to exactly where totality was. And I have to see this again, because this was so awesome. And so then in uh, 2019, this year, in the summer, we went to Chile with some friends and we saw the eclipse in La Serena, Chile. This one was actually around 4 p.m. and it was over the ocean. So that was a totally different thing. And it was amazing. And so I, you know, it's hard to get the money and the time to go to a lot of these because they're in remote locations. But I do intend to try to go to as many as I can. I was not too far away from you in Oregon for the 2017 eclipse. And it was just it's, it's almost a spiritual experience to, to, to see the moon cover the sun. It's just, just very impressive. Um, and so you're also an amateur winemaker. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> I did some of that. Yeah, my husband and I made wine for a couple of years and it was pretty fun. It's like having, you know, a chemistry lab in your in your house and you can you can make some wine. And it was fun to see the fermentation occurring. So we did that for a couple of years and we haven't done it in a long time because when you make wine, you get so much wine and it's just, it's too much. <laughs> it's good and plus, you know, there's only time for a, a few hobbies at once anyway. So we haven't done that in a while, but it was a lot of fun. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, um, so I guess we can, we can open it up for questions now, Laurie, this is a fascinating conversation. There's so many more questions I have, but part of the beauty of this program is to let our viewers ask you questions. And so uh, the, the first question is by uh, Dr. Jim Pass, who tweets as at Astro Sociology. And he asks, I know that you value outreach and education. As such, what is your opinion about what the social sciences and humanities can add to the astrobiological search for extraterrestrial life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so let's see. I do value outreach a lot. And one of the things I really enjoy doing is and in addition to the science itself, is trying to bring more people into science and trying to kind of break down barriers for, for different types of people to be participating in NASA research. And so, I mean, one of the most important things I think social sciences can contribute is by understanding how, you know, how people function in groups and how teams work and how we can best improve, say, diversity and inclusion in our institutes and in our project teams and so on. And it's not something that we're ever trained in, you know, in science. It's to understand, like, how do you how do you deal with different types of people and how do you manage a group and how do you make sure that it's fair and inclusive? And, you know, so this is all stuff where we look to, I think, the social scientists to, to give us tips about how best to proceed. Because I think a lot of astrobiologists care about this, but we don't often know what techniques to apply. That's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Elizabeth Hutton, who tweets as asked 
Astro Budica, and she asks, your research is exactly what I want to do. What <laughs> skill sets should I work on that would be most helpful to a potential mentor doing this or similar research? Well, let's see. You know, I would say, of course, science, like learning about the geology, astronomy, and oceanography, of course, but also I just think learning how to be brave and try new things is important because that's kind of a skill too. And, you know, doing different types of research, even if it's not something that you've done before. But also, uh, if, if you want to be a science PI and do it, leading a team and so forth, understanding how to be a leader and getting opportunities to practice that is very important, even if it's not for work or for school, but just having experience and how to lead and how to you know, manage big projects and things like that, I think is very important. Yeah, the opportunities to push yourself beyond your comfort zone is something that all of you who are early in your career should take advantage of. So great point, Laurie. I'm glad you made it. Um, Garav Yadav on SegaNet asks, which type of hydrothermal vent seems to be the most promising to predict the origin of life, whether it's a deep sea or terrestrial hot spring, and why? Oh, well, I mean, it's not just those two types, right? So each, you know, for example, deep sea vents have many different types. And so I don't think that the point is whether it's on land or in the ocean, it's about what chemistry does it have? And so you could have, for example, a vent that's kind of off the shore, that's near the surface. You could have one on the surface. I think that the ones most likely for some reactions would be alkaline. So that's a higher pH vent and not too hot. So not ones that are so superheated, like hundreds of degrees, like the ones of the black smokers, for example. But different chemistry is, is the important thing. And so just because it's a hot spring doesn't mean it's going to have the right chemistry. You might have different chemistries. And the same is true for the deep sea vents. So I would say there's uh, more than two options. <laughs> uh, Sudipta Biswas on SegaNet asks, were terrestrial hot springs in prebiotic times the same as hydrothermal vents today when it comes to the origin of molecules? Uh, not necessarily. So there were similarities. Uh, but a lot of, a lot would depend on the types of rock. So for Earth, you know, that may have been similar, but for other planets, the types of rock that you're circulating water through could be very different. So that could lead to differences. But also the ocean on early Earth was very different. And one of the important things is that it didn't have oxygen. So when you don't have oxygen in the ocean, you can have a lot more dissolved metals like iron, nickel, and so forth. And that leads to a different type of mineral being precipitated. So that's one main thing is that you get, you get a lot of new types of reactive minerals that are possible when you don't have oxygen. So that's one of the main differences I think that affects the origin of life. Interesting, yep. Uh, Serhat Sevgen, if I pronounce that properly, on SegaNet asks a question that's very similar to, to some of we discussed before, but he focuses, he or she focuses on a kind of more of a, a particular hypothesis for the origin of life, and, and you'll, you'll recognize it in a second. So here she asks, the origin of life on Earth is attributed by some to special alkaline vents. Can you explain what kind of specific geochemistry alkaline vents have that could result in the origin of life on Earth, and why the yes. black smokers are not thought to be uh, involved? Yeah, so the alkaline vents are, they're, they're very interesting because they, if you assume that the early Earth's ocean has, you know, some CO2 dissolved in it, which it would have because the atmosphere had more CO2, then the ocean is a little more acidic than it is today. And so the vent itself is producing alkaline fluid. So you have a different type of pH gradient. And if you compare that to a black smoker, the black smoker is acidic usually. And so that would be not quite the right pH gradient. So the alkaline vent gives you a pH gradient that is similar to life and is thought to have driven some origin of life processes. But also the alkaline vent has a temperature that's pretty mild. So you're not, you're not superheated and destroying organic molecules. It's around like 50 to 90 degrees Celsius, which is a good temperature for a lot of reactions to occur. So it's pH gradient, temperature that's not too hot, and also the types of minerals that are in that vent that are very reactive and interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So again, it's those gradients in chemistry that are so important to jumpstart the chemistry that can sustain life or perhaps create the molecules that can uh, begin life. So it's a fascinating, fascinating science. Uh, Elizabeth Hutton asks again, uh, great question. What are the odds of abiogenesis still occurring today? Or is Earth so like saturated? Crazy. Yeah, right. Or is Earth yeah. so saturated with life that it simply isn't necessary? Or does Earth no longer have the conditions for abiogenesis? That's a great one. So I think about this a lot. And so, you know, abiogenesis it 
So there's two things. One is that early Earth environments were different, and so you need some of that difference in order for origin of life to occur. So things like having an ocean that's anoxic and rich in iron and things like that. But also, even if you assume that maybe some origin of life stuff could happen today, the problem is that life would just eat it because life is dominant on every area of this planet now. It's, it's a complete biosphere, right? And so if you had any kind of abiotic thing happening, it would be vastly outcompeted by life. And so you don't really have the opportunity anymore for this kind of complexity to emerge by itself because life is there and it's way more advanced and it will just consume it. And so when we look for life elsewhere, actually, this is one of the things is that if you didn't have an entire biosphere at this point, you might have life maybe in certain you know, small areas, but maybe if you had origin of life processes that never quite made it to life, you might see more complex stuff than you see on Earth in an abiotic sense. So we don't really know. So yeah, it's a great question. And I think the presence of life on Earth makes Earth not a great analog for understanding abiotic possibilities because they're so suppressed at this point. Yeah, totally, totally. Great question, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Spooky Tardigrade, who tweets as at Just Grelda. And they ask, what do you advise for getting more young students involved in astrobiology? Um, well, I think that it's it would be really important for the students to kind of seek out mentors in the young science community. So people even in you know grad students, but also postdocs and early career scientists, because we are often very happy to talk about our work and we want to help and all that. But also participating in events. There's a lot of different, depending on where you are in the world and what type of science you like. There's a lot of different events and, and programs that you can participate in that will get you more experience in this area. And then for scientists who want to bring young scientists in, I think it's important to, you know, not just wait for people to come to you, but actually try to recruit. So going out to schools and saying, you know, here is research and it's cool and you should join it. And here I have there's internships at JPL or at NASA and you should apply for them. And so I think with kind of both ends doing things, then we can we can establish a lot more presence of people in science. Could you tell us a little bit, Laurie, how you benefited from mentors and what you're doing today to, I know your lab is full of early career people, and I want to make sure you talk about that because that's important. Yeah, um, I think mentors are really important. They've been important for me. I've had various ones from, you know, different stages of my career. And it's important to have different types of mentors, even, you know, for just one person, you need more than one mentor. You, you have mentors who are, let's say, your PhD advisor who can advise you and how your science is going. But you may also have mentors that are sort of general career mentors. Or if you have a certain interest, like uh, if, you, if you want to work for NASA in particular, you might want to have a mentor that works for NASA or knows something about that. And so I have I have cultivated different mentors throughout my career and I continue to do so. And it's good to have people who are both, you know, much older than you or more advanced who know about like the far future, but also people who are just a few years ahead who can sort of advise you on your next steps and so forth. And so I also am interested in being a mentor. So I mentor various students and postdocs in my group and it's a lot of early career people. And I, I find it really fulfilling. It's fun to help other people find the science and the career that they want and try to use my knowledge to help them get where they want to be. Absolutely. And I agree with you with the fulfilling part. That's one of my favorite aspects of being a scientist is to take early careers, bring them through your scientific process and then give them wings for them to do science by themselves. It's a very rewarding, uh, rewarding field in that sense. Um, Satish Chandra on Facebook asks, how can astrobiology help with human colonization of other planets? Hmm, That's a good one. So in a lot of ways, it, it depends on the planet, of course, and what exactly people want to do. But understanding, you know, how to look for life elsewhere is very important. And also because you want to know, all, I think one of the things for colonization is we want to know how life could affect a planet. And we have a good example of that here on Earth, how all life over the four billion years has really affected this planet. And if you're going to go to another planet, how might you affect that planet? But how might life have already affected it and so on? And I think it would also be important to, you know, we'd have to be careful if we go to another planet as humans to not destroy or mess up any other stuff that might be there that we still wanted to study. So, you know, there's a lot of thoughts about, say, preservation and ethical approaches to this type of thing. Yeah, NASA has a dedicated group for planetary protection for that exact reason. So, uh, we, yes, we should explore space, but we should explore it respectfully towards uh, <laughs> others, other species, whether they be microbes that are potentially in, uh, in their own planets. Um, Kashish Nath on Twitter asks, if there are certain organisms we can, which can derive energy from the planet itself, but not the nearby star, 
I guess the question is asking, can we talk about habitable zones in the absence of stars? Yeah, well, it goes beyond, I think, distance from the star. And so, you know, the original definition was about surface water being liquid on the planet, about like temperature at the surface. And that has to do with how far you are from the sun. But yeah, if you had, say, life on Europa, then the habitable zone would extend out to Jupiter. And so as we understand more about how life can be, how life can exist on planets and how, where it might emerge, then the habitable zone could be really anywhere where that is possible. So do you think water is, the, is, a, is an important aspect for life, or could there be other solvents? It's possible there could be other solvents. I focus on water in my work, but there's lots of people who discuss, you know, different organic solvents and things like that. So it's always possible, and there's a lot of really interesting work in that area. It's fascinating to think about life that's so different than, than what we know about terrestrial life. I even wonder if we would even recognize it if we saw it. <laughs> Uh, the next question is by Ahmad Aslam Khan on Saganet, who asks, are there any technical guides or manuals to take use of data coming out from missions, like Cassini, like the rovers and Curiosity, et cetera, especially how to mine the spectroscopic data and from where one can mine this data? In other, in other words, is there ways we can use existing planet, uh, spacecraft observations, download them to our computers, and analyze the data ourselves? Oh, yeah. So I don't actually work on this personally, so I'm not the best person to ask, but there is a planetary data system where data is posted and the NASA data from missions is available mostly. And so some of it is easier to use than others. And, you know, if you have particular questions about a certain data type, then it's good to contact people who work on that on that type of, or maybe that instrument or that type of data. But yeah, generally there it is possible for people to analyze these. Yeah, and the, the, the database is called PDS, Planetary Data System. In fact, there is a, a middle school in, in California who were looking at the photos coming back from uh, the Mars orbiters, and they found a lava cave, uh, a lava tube, uh, independent from all the scientists. They are middle schoolers who found a new geological feature on Mars, which is really cool. So just to show that anybody can download this data coming back from the spacecraft, and NASA makes a big effort to make that available. And, uh, and potentially make interesting discoveries. Uh, the next question is by uh, Julianne Panehal on Twitter, who asks, so excited to see you on Ask an Astrobiologist. Dr. Damer mentioned in last month's episode that he was speaking with you about wet dry cycles. Do you think they are necessary for origins? How does this cycling work? Oh, yes. Yeah. So Ruth and I have talked about this before. and. Uh, so wet dry cycles are important for some chemistry because they can dehydrate things. So the removal of water is a formation of longer molecules that are important. And so wet dry cycles can do that. You may also have possibilities to make that chemistry occur that are not literally drying out and wetting things. So for example, if you cycled between low water activity and high water activity or say temperature could do this. So I think that I don't know that it, if it's necessary or not, but it certainly does promote certain reactions. And so it is something that we work on too. So it's one of many processes that can generate the, the chemistry needed to, to create molecules. Yeah. So, very cool. Uh, Sarah Hatt asks again uh, a great question. Can we infer that in the early Earth, due to the higher inner temperature, that eruptions in mid oceanic ridges were automatic rather than basalting, and, and whether alkaline vents were more dominant than black smokers? I think you addressed this a little bit. Um, so perhaps the question is really focusing on the, the, the higher temperature of early Earth and, and thus potentially the different rocks erupted and how that could have affected the chemistry of springs, of uh, vents. Oh. Yeah, I'm not actually uh, an expert on that particular thing. So, but I, yeah, there would have been alkaline vents on the early Earth and there probably would have also been black smokers. It's a huge planet, right? And so there's a lot of different things. And so I think that even depending on which environment people think is interesting and all of these actually produce interesting chemistry. It's not just one type of vent that does, you know, organic chemistry, for example. And so I think that you would have had a lot of different types and quite a prevalence of alkaline vents in the early Earth. I think ultramafic rocks are interesting as well because uh, they, the, the water rock reaction produces more hydrogen than the water rock with basaltic rocks would be. And hydrogen is kind of your fundamental food source for biology. So that could be interesting as well, kind of to feed the early uh, metabolisms on, on ancient Earth. Just a thought. <laughs> um, Tom Caruso, hi Tom, asks on Facebook, can you explain how the conditions for life formation in your, in your studies connect to the conditions on icy worlds? 
Sure. So, yeah, the, the conditions that we study are mainly for the formation of simple organic molecules in the system driven by specific minerals. And so we are looking at, uh, for example, an alkaline hydrothermal fluid and then an ocean that's more acidic with iron in it usually. And sometimes we do variations on that. And so this is mo most similar to the types of vents that people talk about for Enceladus, for example. So they, there's evidence of vents on Enceladus, though it's not confirmed. But if there are vents there, it might be the type similar to Lost City, where it's an alkaline vent and you have kind of a lower temperature. And so we're also working on uh, temperature gradients in these systems. So trying to heat the inside and then keep the outside cold as opposed to just having the whole thing be room temperature. And that can also affect the chemistry too. And then we also do different types of minerals where you can even make it non-Earth-like. So things like if you had, let's say, an ocean with different metals in it or a very different pH gradient. And so that's, that's one of the, the perks of lab is you can, uh, you can change things up such that it never existed on Earth at all. That's a great target specific environmental variables to see how that affects the entire uh, entire thing. How fragile are the springs, uh, the chimneys that you build in, in, in your lab? It really depends on the type. They're generally very fragile. For some of them that we grow, if you so much as like jostle the experiment, the chimney just falls down. It kind of turns into powder. And so that that type can be unfortunate sometimes if you're trying to say analyze mineralogy. But then other types that we grow, if you are careful, you can remove the ocean with a pipette and the chimney will just stand there and you can take the chimney off and then do things with it. So we, over the years, have kind of, we have certain ideas and recipes where we know that those are going to be more structurally stable. And if you need to do, say, mineralogy on the chimney, we will make the ones that, you know, can remain after you remove the ocean. So there's a bit of an art to it for sure. <laughs> so does your, your, your invader payload can do mineralogy and chemistry? Yes, it can do mineralogy and chemistry. And by combining, you know, what minerals you see in ramen, let's say, with elements that you see in libs, you can start to get at, you know, what types of geochemistry are present and, you know, whether there's life or not, and then also what other elements are there as well. And you can see, say it all out, you can say all that without actually touching the vent system, right? Just using lasers. That's right, a standoff so payload. And so... That is also something to do in the lab, you know, it's important to test in the lab that, that we can get the same or similar some results that you can get by doing all your state of the art sample processing. So that is a part of also what we're working on in my group. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, Garav Yadav on Saganet asks, what type of molecules can be considered biosignatures in the events that you're working with? So that's, that's a good question. And I don't think that there is an answer, honestly, because, you know, we don't know yet what types of molecules can be formed abiotically exclusively or bio biologically exclusively. And kind of, I think the field of origin of life is showing us that there's a lot of complexity and a lot of interesting organic chemistry that can occur without life. And so which molecule is a biosignature I think you'd have to do a thorough study of making sure that cannot be formed abiotically. And so we've, we've begun, but I mean, this is a huge endeavor. <laughs> but that is the question. And anytime people say, oh, this is a biosignature, we should think really hard about can this be formed without life? And even if you haven't seen it on earth yet, can it be done? And if so, we have to figure out how. Yeah, I mean, answering the question of whether or not we're alone in the universe is such an important one to get right. <laughs> that you, we cannot like, <laughs> Dabble and like, oh yeah, perhaps. No, that's a meaningless answer. Um, and so the next question is is much broader uh, in in scope, and it's uh, asked by Art of Inquiry on Twitter, who asks, what topics of astrobiology are the most important to share with young students, in your opinion? Which ones excite you the most, and why? What are the most counterintuitive findings of astrobiology? Oh, that's a good one. It's very broad. So I think it really depends who you ask, of course. So for me, I, I personally like to share things that relate to their experience because I find that that helps them engage more. So for example, if I share astrobiology that's related to missions that they can currently see on like on the news and they can see the data coming back in real time. So things like the Mars rover that's there now or the orbiters that are there now, I think is, is exciting. But also I think it's important to share with them astrobiology that relates to earth science because you know, it kind of links together how we, how we think about the earth and the climate and so forth and how all that related over the long geological time period and how life and earth have been you know, co-evolving for 4 billion years. 
So I think it's important to kind of relate it to the earth and the things that they, that they will experience and also to the missions that they can see. And then, and then later on go into stuff that is more, you know, distant, like missions from the past or other types of science that might be more esoteric. Very cool. Great answer. Thank you. Great question too. Uh, Andrew Planets on SigaNet. Hi, Andrew asks, if all life on Earth is uh, is related, did life start in one instance and then quickly spread, you know, by catalyzing the environment to make its continued existence possible? Or if life started more than once, could different branches have merged? Well, we don't actually know. And so there's various possibilities, you know, so one is that it is just one origin and then it evolved. One is that there's multiple origins, but none of the others worked. One is that there were things that merged. And so I think the thing is all you can really tell from the tree of life is where the root is. And you can kind of go back to say like, what's the last ancestor? But you can't go back beyond that to say, what was all the origin of life things that happened? Because that's not visible in that sense. And so it's now thought that the original ancestor of life was not one cell, but it's a community of cells and you know, genetic materials being exchanged. And there's, it's kind of hard to say it's just one type of life, but was it from one origin or not? We don't really know. So you have to approach this kind of from top down, which is that sort of thing where you look at life now and you say, how does all life relate? And you can get to must be somehow related to the origin. And then you do bottom up where you say, what all was early earth and what could have happened and all those possibilities, which one leads you closest to what that bottom, that top down suggests. So that's kind of where the different origin of life people work. And you try to, you try to meet at something that makes sense from both ends, but but you can't get really the answer from only one or the other. Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about the analogy of using the evolution of humans in a sense that we're homo sapiens now, but we, we were not when we started. And so if you just used homo sapiens as your idea of where humans come from, you'll get it wrong because there was just, you know, Australopithecus, there was Neanderthals and so on. So it's, it's, it's right now we can only do with genetics go down to Luca, the last universal common ancestor, but what's below that is, is, is up to speculation. So uh, good question, Andrew. Uh, Tijal Acharya on Twitter asks, is there any other factor that may influence development of amino acids other than minerals or pH or temperature? Well, yes, there's many, so, so many. So I mean, my favorite ones are concentration of other chemicals. So for example, how much, if you're making an amino acid, you have an amine, right? And so that's a nitrogen component. And so how much nitrogen is in the system and what type of nitrogen is it and where did it come from? And so I think that's one factor that can affect it. And then there's also, I think you mentioned redox, but it's more specific than that. The redox state of minerals in the system can affect things. So even if you have reactive minerals, if they're slightly more reduced or more oxidized, that can affect things. I also bet that if you added other chemicals like say sulfur or phosphorus or things like that, it might affect that. So all of these systems are hugely complex intertwined networks, and you have to sort of understand how the network of chemistry is, is functioning under all these different conditions. So you can see it's, a, it's quite a lot of experiments. It's complicated for sure. That's what makes it exciting. Laurie, I can't believe we've been chatting for practically an hour now. So unfortunately, we have to wrap up the show. But I'm really grateful that you took the time to talk with us today. Perhaps you have any uh, final words of wisdom for the early career scientists who are watching us. Um, well, I guess just to, uh, you know, do things that you're interested in and try to discover new things and don't think that you have to build your career based on what your college degree was in or what your first internship was or whatever. And it's expected, of course, that as you get a job and move forward, you're going to discover all types of new research and new ventures that are interesting. So it's important to just be open to new opportunity and not try to box it in so early. That's, that's great advice. Your university degree does not define who you are as a human or as a scientist at all. It just shows you can solve a difficult problem. Um, so thank you again, Ori. It was absolutely awesome to have you on the show. I loved our conversation. For those of you watching, did you know that today was the first episode of season four of Ask an Astrobiologist? We want to know who would you like to see on the show? Who should we invite and, and, and chat with to have this phenomenal conversations? Um, so let us know, you know, on, on all the social medias and then we'll do our best to, to, to make you guys happy. We're having so much fun here in organizing this program. So uh, until next episode, everybody, stay curious. Take care now. Mm -hmm.